Hi, my name is João Ranhel. I'm from Federal University of Pernambuco, Recife, Brazil. I'm going to talk about neural assembly computing, which explains how groups of spiking neurons process information and how this processing may result in intelligent behavior, maybe in cognition. Let's start with a concept from artificial intelligence, the concept of agent. An agent is a machine or an organism that acts in the environment. Agents have sensors that inform how the world is at a certain moment. Then agents process such information and decide what to do next. In order to act, agents use actuators. In this context, we call behavior the set of actions an agent performs. So what is intelligence? It's not easy to define intelligence. Maybe it's better to observe the agent's behavior, so you might be able to say which is an intelligent behavior and which is not. Consider an environment that is always changing. It seems to be an intelligent behavior if an agent adjusts its actions according to the environmental demands. If an agent predicts future events and anticipates appropriate responses, it certainly has surviving advantages. This is what we consider an intelligent behavior. However, what is cognition? It's a little more complex. Let's consider an agent that has predefined responses to certain stimuli. As the agent's sensors detect a situation, it may consult a lookup table and choose the behavior that fits. We call instincts such as stereotyped responses. On the other hand, agents may acquire capabilities during its lifetime. This is what we call cognition, even though it's a simplification. Let's give an example. No one is born knowing brushing teeth or riding a bike. During your lifetime, you learn the series of steps that result in new skills. Each step on the brushing tape task, we may call a state. One state is to get the brush, the other is to get the toothpaste, and so on. This is an algorithm. This is a representation of a state machine. Each circle is a state, and the execution of the algorithm passes from one state to another. A transition forces the machine to go from one state to another. We may suppose that mammal agents have many finite state machines, which respond for several of our learned stereotyped behavior. Moreover, we may suppose that algorithms interact one another. For instance, if you were brushing teeth, you probably inhibit an algorithm you might use for whistling, but you were able to think on how to solve an ordinary problem. This discussion concerns a high-level behavior. When we argue at that level, we are analyzing the final complex behavior in an agent. Now, let's see. We know that spiking neurons control all these behaviors in organisms. Neuroscientists, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and many reputed investigators in different areas are hardly working for understanding a gap between what we know about neurons and how nervous systems generate intelligent behavior. In this context, neural assembly computing explains how algorithms, decisions, memory, information processing, and learn are performed in spiking neural networks. Let's see how it happens, from spikes to cognitive processes. Let's briefly see how neuron works. We know that the great majority of neurons has an output terminal called axon. Most of time, axons and the neuron cell's body remains at the resting state, which means the cell's membrane is internally minus 65 millivolts compared to the cell exterior. Neurons generate as output an action potential. A brief pulse that lasts one millisecond or so, from now on, called a spike. A spike travels along the axon with a finite velocity. 
enriches other neurons, generally in their dendritic tree. Neurons connect each other through synapses. A spike shape carries no information except that the neuron has fired. It is because the spikes have the same time duration and the same amplitude. Therefore, we can consider a spike a single bit of information that reaches the postsynaptic neuron. When a synapse is strong, a spike can cause a strong perturbation in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. Otherwise, if the synapse is weak, the perturbation is also weak. In an example, if a weak synapse connects the neuron A and B, the membrane of B will be weakly depolarized. It means B becomes less negative, but this change in the membrane is not enough for triggering B and making it to fire. On the other hand, if a strong synapse connects the neurons A and C, the C membrane strongly depolarizes and C fires the spike. The spike takes time to reach the other neurons. In summary, two important parameters control the spike in neural network's dynamics. The first is the synaptic strength, and the second is the spike delay propagation among all neurons in the network. Let's see what happens in a pool of neurons almost fully interconnected. Spikes from a neuron age widely spread into the network area and reach other neurons all at different times. The same happens to spikes from several other neurons. Depending on the synaptic strength, when a spike alone reaches a neuron K, the neuron may or may not fire. However, for some neurons in the pool, spikes from different neurons may coincide, causing a strong perturbation capable of triggering this neuron. Hence, neurons seem to function reliably as coincidence detector. Coincident spikes reaching the K-neuron causes a perturbation in its membrane called EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. So consider a neuron as a coincidence detector and let us call theta the minimal EPSP that makes the K-neuron to fire. We can calculate values for pre- and postsynaptic connections by dividing theta by the number of neurons in the presynaptic set. If all or almost all presynaptic spikes reach the postsynaptic neurons simultaneously, the key neuron certainly fire. However, the neuron key may not be the unique neuron in which the spikes coincide. In this direction, other neurons, K1, K2, K3, and so on, may also detect coincidences. They may fire synchronously or in a restricted time window. Therefore, a group of presynaptic neurons may trigger another group of postsynaptic neurons. The working groups introduces advantages. For example, if one or few neurons in the group fail, the other firing neurons maintain the information represented by that group. Now let's change to another level of abstraction. In order to describe groups of pre- and postsynaptic neurons, we will call neural assembly the groups of neurons that fire together. Thus, neural assemblies are ephemeral phenomena that happens during a short time period, when groups of neurons fire together in response to some stimuli. When we say assembly A, we are talking about all neurons in the group A. If we say A is fully connected to B, it means all neurons from A are connected to all neurons of B. When we say the mean spike propagation delay from A to B is 40 milliseconds, it means that spikes from A takes approximately 40 milliseconds to reach B. Now, let's see some neural assembly properties. Firstly, if spikes from A can trigger all neurons in an assembly F, we say F is caused by A. Now, suppose B can also trigger F. It means that A or B can trigger F. This is a logical function OR. 
Suppose now that two assemblies, C and D, are connected to F by half of theta. These two assemblies may trigger F only if all spikes from C and D coincide in F. This is an AND logical function. Now, let's suppose that an assembly E have an inhibitory connection to F. We can consider this function as the NOT logical function. Memorizing information is important for retaining data for posterior sequential processing. It is simple to construct a 1-bit memory in neuroassembly computing with a reverberating loop. Consider an assembly R that triggers S, that triggers T, that triggers U, that triggers R back. These assemblies form a loop that may reverberate forever. Such a loop retains one bit of information. In order to dismantle the loop, we need to inhibit one assembly. This kind of loop is also important for creating rhythms in the spiking neural network. By joining this base of functions, AND, OR, NOT, and memory, we can create a range of gates and complex functions that control information processing. For instance, consider you have an assembly G connected to an assembly P with a synaptic strength of half of theta. An assembly I has each of its neurons connected one to one to each neuron in G. These connections are also made by half of theta. It means that when spikes from P reach G, each neuron in G is half sensitized. At this time, every spike from any neuron I is capable of triggering its correlated neuron in G. In this sense, the assembly G performs a sampler. Once enabled by T, the gate G takes a sample of those neurons fires in I. After sampling, the number of firing neurons in X represents an analog value, which is proportional to stimuli coming from the input sensor I. Moreover, we can easily compare the sample from an assembly X with a threshold, or we can get a sample from another assembly and compare them. We can easily create a network topology that can decide which of these two values is the greater. These are examples of how we combine assemblies to construct information processing functions. We were talking about sequences of actions minutes ago. I said that finite state automata sequentially process information. Let's see how neuroassembly computing can perform finite state automata. Let's start by creating the state diagram so we can understand what is happening in the network step by step. Let's say we need a sequential machine that responds only to a sequence of inputs 1, 0, 0. The meaning for this sequence can be many. For instance, I have to buy something, 1, but I have no money in my pocket, 0. My wife is not near, 0. Therefore, I decide to go to the bank. We start in the state S0, then the need of buying something, 1, cause a transition to the state S1. If I have money, okay, I can remain in S1 and go shopping. However, if I don't have money, a zero causes the transition to S2. If my wife lends me some money, I'll go back to S1. But if she cannot give me the money, zero, a transition puts my finite state machine on S3. I have to go to the bank. After going to the bank, if I get money, 1, a transition puts my machine in S1. But if the bank is closed at 0, I'll go back to the initial state S0. Let's see this finite state automaton in neural assembly computing. In this raster plot, we see firstly the rhythm for this network. The assembly K2 triggers K3, which triggers K4, which triggers K2 back. And it repeats 
while we are executing this automaton. Every time the K2 assembly fires, the network inserts an external stimulus. This stimulus can be 1 or 0. If 1, this assembly K1 fires, otherwise it remains silent. We start in S0 represented by this loop. K1 introduces an external stimulus synchronized to K2. As A1 enters, the machine goes to the S1 state represented by this loop. Then an input 0 enters, so the machine goes to S2. Once in S2, another 0 enters, so the automaton goes to S3. Back to my money example, my machine decides to go to the bank, because the sequence of inputs forces it to reach the finite state S3. The machine is now in S3 and the input is 1. Hence, as predicted in the state diagram, this transition puts the machine in the S1 state. Note that another one comes, thus the machine stays in S1. As two zeros come in sequence, the machine reaches S3 again. Now, if a zero comes, the transition goes to the S0 state. The beauty on this is that the process occurs this way. All assemblies fire in a brief moment, ephemerally. Algorithm is a bit more complex than finite state automata. In the neuroassembly context, we associate finite state automata with decision-making networks. Let's see the execution of an algorithm in neuroassembly computing. Firstly, let's specify a task for the agent. Consider an agent that has an internal assembly whose population is active proportionally to its hunger. Suppose the agent has a sensor for external cues that lead it to find food. Somehow, what the sensor captures in the environment has to become spikes for the agent's neural network. Let's simulate it by this population, which was modulated for our purpose. Let's see the result in a raster plot. As an example, this assembly senses smell. Each neuron fires according to a normal distribution in randomized frequencies. The task for this algorithm is to lead the agent in the food direction. It can be achieved by following the higher level of the food smell. In order to do that, the agent has to turn its head left, has to take a sample of the smell in that direction, and has to memorize this value for comparison. Then, the agent turns its head to the center, takes another sample and memorizes it. Hence, it turns its head to the right, takes a sample of the smell and compares the values in order to make a decision. Let's look how it happens in neural assembly computing. We use the CK assembly as a rhythm, as the system clock. Every time the lower CK assembly fires, we take a sample of the hunger representation, called here assembly X. Note that X is a sample of A1. As said earlier, a decision-making topology may change its state as the level of X goes above certain threshold. Note that R is active while the agent is hungry. While the agent is not in the R state, the algorithm searching for food is in the S0 state. After activating the hungry state, the agent must search for food. It happens after a volitive command is received from other part of the system, maybe another algorithm. Such a command is hierarchically superior to this algorithm searching for food. When this assembly fires, it means a volitive command was received, so the finite state automaton goes to the state S1. It commands another automaton for turning the head left. 
After that, another volitive command takes a sample from the input smell representation and memorizes it. This is a short-term memory which retains an analog value. Next, the head is turned to the central position and another volitive command takes a smell sample. Likewise, it is memorized by these assemblies. However, now we can analyze what happens on another circuit, a topology that compares the samples. When the algorithm has only one sample, the comparators would say only that the contents of the L memory is greater than the C memory and also greater than the R memory. Now, the content of the C memory is greater than the L, although the judgment is still partial. Another volitive command and the agent turns the red to the right, takes a smell sample and memorizes it. Now, the comparators present the complete result. The algorithm now has the comparator R greater than C active and R greater than L active. Based on these comparisons, this algorithm can command hierarchically inferior central pattern generators, CPGs. By commanding CPGs, the agent can move its body to the right direction. The algorithm proceeds while the hungry state is active. As we can see in this simulation, if something dismantles the R loop, the algorithm stops. This is our view on how spiking neural assemblies can generate complex behaviors. You can now imagine how complex systems can emerge from algorithms interacting with one another. These algorithms may deal with analog and digital values in the same substratum, which is spiking neural networks with propagation delays. How about cognition? How algorithms interacting on another may transform an intelligent into a cognitive agent. As we admitted earlier, cognitive agents change their behavior as they pass through experiences during their lifetimes. Changes on synaptic connections are the most common transformation in neural networks. Such changes can calibrate the neural networks for optimal operational conditions but it can also permanently cause modification in the agent's network topology. This subject is quite complex and there's no time to stress it here. Many factors and mechanisms operating on both neural and synaptic plasticity may cause such a transformation. Thus, I decided to show the influence of one of these factors, called spike time dependent plasticity, or STDP for short. This figure shows a pre and a post synaptic neuron. If a spike from a pre reaches a post synaptic neuron and then the post synaptic neuron fires, it means the pre synaptic spike has contributed to generate the post synaptic spike. When it occurs, a series of biophysical processes strengthen the synapse. The closer the temporal relation on pre to post synaptic firing, the greater is the strengthening. On the other hand, when a postsynaptic neuron fires and after this a presynaptic spike arrives in this neuron, it means the presynaptic spike did not contribute to the postsynaptic spike at all. In this case, the synapse is weakened. The closer the temporal relation on post to presynaptic firing, the greater is the synaptic depression. This raster shows a simulation of how STDP works. Observe the red spikes in relation to the green ones. Red spikes come from a presynaptic neuron and green spikes come from a postsynaptic neuron. At this point, the green neuron fires and then a spike from the red neuron reaches it. This causes a synaptic depression shown here in blue. At this time, a red spike comes early before the green spike, causing potentiation. But subsequently, a red spike appears after a green firing, causing depression. The average between potentiation and depression controls the temporary synaptic efficiency. 
Near the end of the simulation, a spike burst from pre pause neurons positively increases the synaptic strength. It may cause permanent changes in the synaptic waves. STDP is the spike time independent component of a multi-factor plasticity process. It depends on firing rate, spike timing, dendritic depolarization and synaptic cooperativity. Spike timing is an important factor for plasticity, but it's not universal or even always dominant. In fact, learning and memory occur in synapses by means of many mechanisms, which involves glutamate, AMPA, NMDA, calcium, second messengers, kinases, gene transcriptions, astrocytes, and so on. Interesting for us is that it is computationally possible to reduce all these factors to single changes in the synaptic efficiency. We have worked on implementing algorithms with different strategies of neuroplasticity. We believe this can lead us to construct agents with certain level of cognitive capabilities. We can conclude that cell assemblies emerge in spike neural networks with propagation delay. The propagation delay naturally causes cell assemblies. Representing and computing with cell assemblies mean an evolutionary advance, because groups of neurons are more robust and reliable than a single cell. Interactions among cell assemblies can create logical functions, sequential machines, decision-making circuits, and other blocks necessary for creating algorithms. Spiking neural networks can execute many algorithms in parallel. Some algorithms may hierarchically control simpler central pattern generators. By using such structures, it is possible to construct complex and intelligent behaviors. I do not claim that this is the way brain works. But this is one explanation about a kind of computation that spiking neural networks can execute. Potentiation and depression on synaptic weights may change the topology in these machines, promoting permanent changes in the algorithm they perform. It is common to relate these changes with cognitive processes. Therefore, neural assembly computing can explain from bottom up how spiking neurons can generate intelligent and possibly cognitive behavior.